Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society, and I'm delighted today to be joined by a face that's well known to the NAMS crowd, and that is Dr. Andrew Kunitz. He's a professor and associate chair in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville, Florida. He is also a past board member of the North American Menopause Society. Welcome, and thank you for joining me. It's great, it's great to be back together, Marlon even if it's virtual. So I wanna talk about this because it comes up in the office all the time. Um, older women who don't see themselves as necessarily being in the reproductive years um, might be perimenopausal with some menstrual irregularity and we tend not to focus or think about contraception at all. So where are we going wrong here? So um, I was just talking with a patient this morning, a 48 year old woman who, um, uh, the last thing on her mind, just as you implied, is contraception. And in fact, um, I think we all recognize that the um, fecundability or you know, tendency to become pregnant for a 48-year-old woman is lower than that, let's say, of a 28-year-old woman. Um, but pregnancy still can happen until women are actually menopausal, when there hasn't been a spontaneous bleeding episode for the last year. And we know that um, among um, perimenopausal women or older reproductive age women, Marla, we know that there are a lot of um, chronic medical issues that start accumulating. And so diabetes, um, hypertension are both uh, considerably more common in that age group than in younger women. And pregnancies are associated with greater risk because of comorbidities, but they also tend to be particularly not desired among women in their late 40s or early 50s who are perimenopausal. That group, when they do conceive, ha has a very high rate of abortion, just underscoring that this is a time in a, in a woman's life when most women uh, are not looking to become pregnant. Yeah, that is true. And asking you know, that question, I think, what would an unanticipated pregnancy mean for you is probably something that I, I rarely ask and should be asking. So let's, let's get more specific. So let's say a 48-year-old woman um, she's been taking oral contraceptive for years. And we get this question all the time. Can I check her FSH level? And will that be useful for me to know that I can take her off contraception and not worry about her at all? Yeah, I think it's almost universal that um, women in that setting do get gonadotropins checked or perhaps yes. an estradiol level checked. So turns out that checking an FSH or FSH and LH is not only not useful in that setting, but it actually can be misleading. Um, um, and um, uh, much better is to recognize that in lean, healthy women, um, uh, older reproductive age women, it is safe and appropriate for them to continue on, for instance, combined contraceptives, uh, pill, patch, or ring, um, until their mid-50s. Uh, and I'm here I'm referring to women who are at risk for pregnancy. I mean, women who are not sexually active or they or their partner have had a surgical sterilization procedure, um, they could consider stopping combined hormonal contraception perhaps in their early 50s. But if the median age of menopause is let's say 52 thereabouts, um, that means that 50% of 52 year olds are still fertile. Um, not as, again, not as fertile as 28 year olds, but they still ovulate, they're not yet menopausal. But by age 55, more than 95% of women are now menopausal. And so um, according to NAMS guidance, which is congruent with American College OBGYN guidance and CDC guidance, it's appropriate for good candidates for combination methods, healthy, lean, non-smoking women to continue combination pill, patch, or ring right up to age 55. And at that point, if they want to transition seamlessly to um, systemic hormone therapy, they can, or if they want to um, stop and go off um, hormonal contraception and see how they feel off hormones, well, they can do that without having to worry um, about becoming pregnant. So one of my favorite other topics aside from contraception is bone health. So I'm gonna ask you a whole bunch of questions about um, contraceptives. And I also want to ask you about Implanon in Canada. We now have Nexplanon, which is the same thing, and DMPA. So let's take each of those. So firstly, in, in older reproductive age women, so we're talking about women who, who are at a point where we think about of them 
getting ready to have accelerated bone loss, what impact first would an oral contraceptive have on bone health and bone loss? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Marla. Um, so in younger women, let's say teens and women in their 20s and 30s, um, oral contraceptives um, in general are not going to be bone positive. However, in perimenopausal women who, if they're not on hormones, start are starting to experience, just as you implied, an accelerated decline in bone mineral density, it turns out that women on the combination pill in their 40s um, uh, will end up reaching menopause with greater bone mineral density and a, a, a lower risk of hip fracture than women in their 40s who do not take oral contraceptives. So in perimenopausal women, women who are starting to experience decline of ovarian function, the estrogen and progestin in contraceptives is bone positive and actually prevents fractures. So now let's look at um, DMPA, the injectable Provera, um, uh, progestin, and also the um, Implanon, which you've had in the United States and now in Canada is marketed under Nexplanon, the different impact that they may have on bone loss if they're already implanted in a woman in uh, her perimenopausal years or so being used as an injectable. So the progestin implant, we could start with that because that's a simpler um, story. The uh, etanogestral implant, whether it be um, Implanon, Nexplanon, they, they, they are equivalent from an endocrine perspective. Um, um, the studies that have looked at, at bone mineral density in implant users have shown no impact. Um, and, and women using the contraceptive implant, they are experiencing a low serum level of progestin. Um, in contrast, women um, using um, the injectable contraceptive, uh, depomedroxy progestin acetate or DMPA, uh, that's a high dose um, progestin only injectable. Uh, and it's associated with profound ovulation suppression. And it also reduces ovarian production of estradiol. The implant doesn't with its low progestin serum levels. Depo-Provera does reduce ovarian estradiol production. So during uh, in current users of the injections, bone mineral density drops. Um, the good news is it recovers after women have stopped Depo-Provera. And in fact, um, there have been no studies that show that use of um, Depo-Provera during the reproductive years leads to a higher risk of postmenopausal fractures. Where this has been studied best is actually in New Zealand, where Depo-Provera is quite widely used. Um, and, and a cross-sectional study um, of um, postmenopausal women was conducted there. And Women um, who were prior users of Depo-Provera, uh, excuse me, menopausal women who were prior users of injections um, were compared with menopausal women who had never used injectable contraception and their bone mineral density was equivalent in those two groups. Um, so we don't, we don't have um, prospective data following women from their reproductive years using injections then till their postmenopausal years, but the best available data we have shows that um, use of Depo-Provera in reproductive age women does not lead to fractures or osteoporosis later in life. Which is reassuring. It is. So one last question. One of the most common tools that we use in many practices in perimenopausal women with irregular bleeding and thinking about contraception as well is to be using an IUS, an intrauterine system that has progestin. So how might that be used in perimenopause going into menopause, and how might that be useful actually for transitioning from one to the other? Well, um, um, you, you're bringing up, I think, um, a particularly uh, appropriate and useful strategy for uh, older um, reproductive age women, perimenopausal women. Um, the, the IUD um, is safe whether or not women have risk factors that might contraindicate combined methods like the pill. Uh, that hypertensive woman, the woman who smokes, um, um, the woman with a, a high BMI, um, these are women who in their, uh, after age 35, we would not feel comfortable with them using uh, combination methods, but um, the progestin IUD would be particularly suitable in this setting. And then 
um, in, in older reproductive age women using progestin IUDs, most of them uh, over time will become amenorrheic uh, as our audience recognizes. Um, and then the, um, the onset of perimenopause will not, be, um, uh, will, will, will not be obvious because of menstrual changes because women are already amenorrheic but they'll start noticing hot flashes. Right. And, um, and again, you don't need to check the natatropins in this setting. You just need to start um, systemic estrogen. And if the patient uh, is a lean, healthy perimenopausal woman with an IUD in place, she can use oral or transdermal estrogen. But if she has obesity or other cardiovascular risk factors, and she's a perimenopausal IUD user now experiencing moderate or vasomotor symptoms, um, I think you and I would agree that a patch would be more appropriate yes. because it doesn't increase the risk of thrombosis or stroke. And, and the combination of a progestin IUD then with adding estrogen when symptoms occur allows women, I like to say, to, um, to sail through or surf through perimenopause in a, in a, uh, without symptoms and then um, when, uh, once they're in their mid fifties, they can decide whether or not they'd like to transition um, um, to systemic hormone therapy or not. But, um, but perimenopause becomes a, a much less symptomatic, much smoother process um, through the use of the IUD and then when appropriate systemic estrogen with the IUD. And we do wanna punctuate that here we're talking about a progestin IUD and not a copper IUD. Absolutely. So not, not to be confused. So before I let you go, one last question. There's always one last question. Um, the Society of Obstetrics of Gynecology of Canada, and I'm sure ACOG as well, has come out with a statement just in terms of contraception with things like a Mirena IUS that you can leave it in for at least one year longer, um, particularly mm -hmm. under, you know, this conditions yes. that we're operating now. So is the same true for um, a woman who uh, is got something like an IUS and that was you know, typically a five-year use IUS, and now she's, you know, year four, let's say year four and a half, having hot flashes and night sweats, you're giving her a low-dose transdermal patch, she's feeling really well. How long can you stretch out that that um, uh, IUS in terms of, or progestin IUD, as we say, in terms of protection for her beyond that five-year mark? Well, um, we're we're, we don't have data looking at endometrial safety right. and, and with systemic estrogen use in, um, in women who, uh, with, uh, on their sixth or seventh year of, uh, of uh, uh, Liletta or Mirena, the 52 milligram, the larger progestin mm -hmm. IUD. So since we don't have data, I would say if the patient's going more than five years, I might consider guest checking um, a vaginal ultrasound to, to assess endometrial thickness, perhaps annually, um, and it should stay very thin. Um, and I, I would, uh, assuming that endometrial thickness stays thin and she doesn't change her bleeding pattern over time, start bleeding where she wasn't bleeding, which should prompt uh, in that setting an endometrial biopsy. But assuming that doesn't happen, and it probably wouldn't happen, um, I, I think the patient could continue um, uh, up to seven years of the 52 milligram Mirena or Liletta IUD. And I'm glad you brought that up because you and I both see patients and our viewers see patients just like that. And, and we don't have to you know, change out or, or, or discontinue IUD um, at five years. Um, I think there would be room to go um, another year or two in that setting. And particularly under these circumstances, it's so helpful. As always, it's been a thrill talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Marla. Take care.